Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 83, Home for a Rest, games to keep you occupied when stuck at home. I'm Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, your RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. As of our recording right now, a large part of the world has been asked to stay home and practice social isolation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to this, I thought it'd be worthwhile for us to talk about some great games for playing while you're stuck at home, especially when stuck at home for an extended period. Some great games to keep you occupied in the coming weeks and for any future time at home. Now, I've also got a review of Talisman Legendary Tales and some gaming with my kids in our Tabletop Bellhop segment featuring two games. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a couple of comments on our Gold West review from last week. Dylan Zimmerman says, we also love this game. We were glad you liked it. Fiona was like, oh man, if he thinks Gold West sucks, that's going to be a bummer. <laughs> well, thanks, Dylan. Uh, it's good to hear someone else has actually heard of and played this game before me showing it to them. It really does seem to have slipped under almost everyone's radar. Like, no one talks about Gold West. So I'm glad someone else discovered it outside of our circle of friends. Well, Roger Malosh had this to say about Gold West. For some reason, I found this game very intuitive and enjoyable. Could be a minor wiring problem in my brain. <laughs> Uh, regardless, it's going on my must-buy list. Well, I'm right there with you, Roger. There is just something about that game that just flows really well. Like, the actions somehow make sense or are intuitive for what you're doing. And, like, yeah, the Mancala system does take some skill to master, but the rest of it just flows so well. And it's kind of odd because it's not what I would call a thematic game because that theme could have been anything. Well, Emmett O'Brien had some things to say about last week's main comic topic of house rules. I'm generally a written rules as written proponent. I've made one slight alteration to that, though. For RPGs, digesting a rule book is a daunting task for many that could prevent people from playing at all. With that in mind, I've updated my stance to play to the best of your knowledge. If you're into something you don't know, make a ruling. Notify everyone you're making a ruling. Take note of it somehow. Then last, update your knowledge of how you intended to handle that situation. And Catan Robber Threshold. We've used, not everyone likes the robber in my family. You can't have the robber on you if you don't have any victory <laughs> points. Well, thanks for the comments, Emmett. Um, playing to the best of your knowledge is a good way to put it, actually. I admit to doing the same. Some RPG rule books are massive tomes, and trying to learn everything at once is very daunting. And to be honest, it's almost impossible that you're going to remember everything the first time around, or even the first few games. Now, personally, I'm of the camp where I look up the rules right then when they come up, if there's a mistake. But you know what? Making a ruling and then making sure people knowing it's a ruling is a great way to go, and that is where a lot of groups tend to fall on that fence. I just personally would add a follow-up to double-check the rules after the fact, then get back to the group and say, well, we did it this way this time. The real way is this. And then, together as a group, decide which way you want to play going forward. As for your robber rule for Catan, I like it. That's a good way to make sure players that haven't actually started building their engines don't get punished. It's very similar to the whole, you don't use the robber for the full turn, but you know what? It's a little bit more forgiving because it may take people a couple turns to actually get moving in that game. Well, Doug Glover has a comment going back to our big army miniature game alternative. He writes, because sometimes Threadheads secretly love airplanes too, <laughs> Blood Red Skies by Warlord Games. Six small airplanes in a squadron which even a mediocre painter like me can finish in a weekend. But 
I warn you, as a beer and pretzels air combat game, it is addicting, and your pledge to not build an army becomes, what is one more box of just six little airplanes? Of course, I may be biased. The game drug me away from big army games like 40k last year, mm-hmm. simply for the low cost of entry and quick painting of aircraft. Well, thanks, Doug. I gotta say, it sounds like pretty much every miniature skirmish game out there. Like, I remember when War Machines, War Machines Hordes, first came out, and they were like, you only need five units to be able to play this. Look, it's nothing like Warhammer. And then I look at the local War Machine players with their massive armies and trying to sell complete units, and I, I, like I, I'm sure it's done on purpose, right? It's once you, once you buy it, you're like, yeah, you only need five to play, but you're going to want a lot more. I will be sure to throw Blood Red Skies in our show notes and note that it's a great game for people who don't want to collect a full army. I've not tried that one myself. Again, I'm not a huge miniature gamer, despite the thousands of miniatures behind me. All right, well, some more feedback from last week, this time on our Carpe Diem review. Dave Hutchinson writes, I played it with Mo, and he was great. <laughs> well, thanks for the comment, Dave. Now, Dave is another great example for this game of a gamer who doesn't usually dig heavier games. Now, I can talk Dave into playing something heavy, but he definitely prefers the lighter, more Ameritrash, random, lots of silly things happening style of games. And it's great to see that he loved Carpe Diem. It's just another example of how that game seems to appeal to non-heavy gamers, despite being quite the brain burner. Well, and finally, we're back to Roger Malone, who had this to say about Carpe Diem. Played it, loved it, added it to my must-buy list. Well, at this rate, Roger's going to have to stop gaming with me or his must-buy list is going to end up costing him a lot of money. So, Roger, if you do ever want to play any of those games, I own them. Just let me know and I'll bring them out. Well, once we're allowed to go out in public again. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, tonight we are talking about games to play while stuck at home. So whether it's March break, stuck at home with the kids, you're raining outside, or there happens to be a worldwide pandemic going on. You need some time, some stuff to do. What are you going to do when you're done? So what I want to know from the chat room is what kind of games are you looking forward to playing during this time at home or any future time? Now, I did see something Ryan mentioned in the chat that we're going to have to toss into the main game list because I did miss solo games. That was something I think when Sean and I talked about this topic, I mentioned it and I totally forgot to put it in the show notes. So we're going to toss that one on the end of the notes, and that's more a head up, heads up for Sean so he doesn't keep going once we get to the end. We're going to try to come up with some of the best solo games. So what we've got is a bunch of, a bunch of games that I think are going to be great from when you're stuck at home. But other than that, what do we have going on in the chat? I'm uh, sure like, there's some people there. Frostgrave is better than War Machine for small skirmish war bands because the character types are limited enough that you don't feel compelled to buy more. That's interesting, too. And Frostgrave, when it launched, and I think this has changed, When it launched, did not have its own miniature range. And it was supposed to be the fantasy miniature game where you could use any miniatures you already own, which I actually thought was a really cool way to do it. Just like uh, Gaslands is also from the same company, is you could use your existing Matchbox cards or Hot Wheels cards, which even those of us who are older now and don't have kids tend to have one or two still laying around the house, probably in that kitchen drawer with everything else all thrown together. So that, that seems to be an Osprey thing, right? Osprey Games puts out these miniature games like, you don't have to buy our miniatures, use other people's. Now, I am pretty sure Frostgrave does have their own minis now. Uh, and Re- Ryan's mentioning that he knows of at least one other blind, blind board gamer who's into the Frostgrave. Well, that's cool. I'll admit I haven't seen it. Now, there was a group that was playing at the CG Realm one night when I showed up, but I was also, I think it was the day I was showing off Cthulhu Death May Die. So I, I didn't get a chance to check them out because I wanted to get the game set up and ready to demo. Right. And Jeff mentions that while they do have a mini range, it's just an option. It is miniature agnostic. So yeah, that's what it's options see, for people who don't have miniatures already. In. Yeah, for, it makes sense, right? So because I'm sure people got into it and there was there's a big buzz about this game because it's one of the few campaign based games that have RPG elements. Right. So instead of just having your little units of guys they actually improve and you can get better and you can play through campaigns and they sell campaign books and stuff. I got to admit, it sounds really cool. It's, it's, it reminds me of like a modern um, modern 
more time, I guess, in a way that that, that used to play. Now, the other thing we were talking about in the chat room is um, playing games online. So this is another thing that we're we're not going to cover in the main topic, but I think is worth bringing up here is one of the alternatives right now, of course, or when you're stuck at home, is to play digitally. And for that, we are going to recommend, and this is not based on personally, well, from personal experience, I'm going to recommend Board Game Arena because Board Game Arena is fantastic. It's, it's, it's almost free. Uh, it is free to play for most people. If you have one member of your group as a paid subscriber, they can then launch any of the games and invite the non-paid subscribers. But even the cost of the subscription is very low for what you get, and they have a ridiculous selection. So Board Game Arena is our strongest recommendation, but that's honestly only because it's the one we know. There is also Yukata, Yukata.de, which we tried a couple games on and seems really good and really solid, but I haven't played around with it enough. There's also Brett Spiel Welt, which we'll throw in the show notes a link, and Tabletopia. Both of those we haven't tried at all. So in the coming weeks, probably with the amount of time we've got right now, we're going to check some of those out and try to get a future show while we're actually comparing them. Mm. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask a Bellhop. Uh, social media works too, of course. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website so that they don't get lost and I get a nice notification on my phone and all that. I'm not going to say no, though, to a question asked anywhere out there on the web. So right now, as we record the show, um, everyone listening to us live and everyone who's listening to this on Tuesday is sure well aware. But just in ha case you happen to be listening to this in the, in the future at some point, going through our backlog, uh, we are in lockdown. Actually, everyone in Ontario is in lockdown due to the COVID-19 virus, which is spreading like wildfire all over the world. Now, so far, the two of us and our families are perfectly fine, but we are doing our part by staying home and only going out when absolutely necessary, and when we do, practicing social distancing when we do. Now, this is a tough time for people with a lot of uncertainty and confusion. And for many people, uncertain futures with their sources of income gone. As yeah. gamers, we already understand the power of games to help distract, de-stress, and, if only for a little while, help us forget about problems elsewhere. Games yes. are important, perhaps even more so during these uncertain times. Yeah, because here in Ontario, restaurants and bars are shut down. All local facilities are shuttered, libraries and everything. Libraries are closed. Most retail outlets are doing delivery or special orders only or having you pick up at the door. Pretty much all the game conventions have been canceled. Everyone for March, at least, most of the April ones. And, well, all the local gaming events are on hold until further notice. Yeah, studies just released uh, yesterday indicate that this isn't going to or shouldn't end anytime soon. Precautions of some form will need to be in place for extended periods to ensure that the virus remains contained until vaccinations are available. But... All that doesn't mean that we can't get some gaming in. And I think it's a very healthy thing to do. As Sean mentioned, this is a great way to distract yourself from what's going on in, in the world, uh, a way to uh, a shelter from all of the bad news and all, all the, the distress. Like, I think this is actually the perfect time for people to do some gaming with their families and others isolated with you. Now, having all this time, to me is an indicator that this is a good time to get in some longer games, some epic games you normally wouldn't have time through, to, to play through. It's also a great time to play through that legacy game or campaign games that needs the same group week after week and would normally take you a long time to finish. I also think it's a good chance to try gaming outline, uh, gaming online, sorry, outline, uh, playing RPGs through conference software or any of the many sites designed to support it and playing board games through apps or Steam or some of the sites we just mentioned in our last section. Now, just be patient for now, as some of these sites are still struggling with the increased loads brought on by this unexpected isolation of the population. Our site of choice, Board Game Arena, has been working hard to ramp up their capacity, and even sites like Roll20 for the uh, role-playing groups have had some initial outages in those very yeah. fir first days of the isolation. So tonight we are going to talk about some games that I think are great when playing when you're stuck at home uh, for a longer period than you may want to be. Uh, like I said, this is probably like a March break or longer. So 
we've kind of broken this into categories where this is the type of games that I think this is your chance, right? I think about games that you don't normally, stuff that would sit on your shelf, stuff that you're like, man, that's been in my pile of shame forever. Those are the main kind of games I think now's your chance, right? Here's here's your your chance to finally get those big games to the table, those epic games to the table, or those campaign games to the table. That was my main focus here. So now we did have someone in the chat room, Ryan, Red Meeple Ryan, who also re mentioned that solo play is another great thing to do, especially if you've got non-gamers living with you. So we're going to try to tack that on the end as well, because it's not something, that's not where my head was when I when I was working on today's list, but it's also an excellent suggestion. So I think we're going to start off with the really long stuff. The epic games yeah. that are going to take you four or more hours, stuff where you might never consider leaving it out because of time. But, you know, if you're all home, you can eat somewhere else for a little while yeah. and keep that game set up on the table for a few days if you need. Yeah, very true. So the, these are the big ones. These are the names that normally, if I was going to play any of these games, I would schedule an event. I, I would make it an event night. I would invite people over to my house earlier in the afternoon. I would go through a rule teach. We would all sit down and have dinner together. Then we would sit down for the long haul and play, which would probably involve one or more breaks because that's what normally happens. Now, with everyone at home, with everyone in this basically stuck together, like Sean said, you can start it in the morning. You can come back to it later. You can play. You can play for 12 hours straight without any impact, maybe. Or you can break it up in four-hour shifts. So the first game I got on my list is, of course, the the grandfather of big games, the the one most people know, and the game that everyone knows is way too long that it should be, but always fun despite being so long, and that is Twilight Imperium. Now, I'll admit my version of Twilight Imperium I know is third edition, and I have played a game with eight players that was over twelve hours long, and we loved it. You just it's one of those games that, despite being a long involved game, you don't notice it. You're so invested in the game and caught up in what's happening and planning ahead and trying to decide what technologies to make and where you're going to make your next move that you don't notice the time going by. Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, I've only tried once. And everything I've read about telling you it's shorter, streamlined, and quicker seems to be true. The game we played was excessively short, but I think that was more based on player experience than your usual expectations. But in this case, like, I think I would break out the original Twilight Imperium. Well, the original would be first opinion edition. I don't know the original. I would break out the third edition with every optional rule, with all the extra exploration cards and all the exploration tokens and the Shattered Alliance expansion and just go to it. And I would try to fit in multiple games. I'd be like, you know what? Every Monday, we're going to start a new game at Twilight Imperium and see how it goes and see how long during the week it takes if we play for four hours a night or whatever. Oh, so that's... Uh... Twilight Imperium, uh, third edition for the real slog, or for a little more <laughs> slightly streamlined version, there's that fourth edition. That's out now. Yes. Up next, I've got Zaya Legends of a Drift System. Now, this can be a quick game, because one of the features of Zaya Legends of a Drift System is that you can decide how many fame points to play to. And a quick game is five points. And I got to admit, a five-point game is over too quick, in my opinion. You, don't, you almost don't even get to upgrade your ship. It, it's it's over too quickly. Like, that's not even worth playing. And a 10-point game is your usual game. But you know what? The, the score card goes to 20. And, man, that makes for a long game. I've only ever done it once, and it was overnight at an Extra Life event. And I think we went about eight hours. I don't know. I was very tired. And it was a lot of fun. And it was another one of those games where you don't notice the time passing. But you know what? There's no reason to stop at 20. Why not do a 40 fame point game of Zaya? when everyone's going to have level three ships and everyone's going to have multiple contracts and everyone's going to have multiple powers. There's no reason you can't just keep going past that point on the score track at all. And actually the same thing for Twilight Imperium. There is a long game you can play in Twilight Imperium just by adding, because it's, it's a race to 10 points. You can make it to 14. So Zaya, uh, it's, it's, we've talked about it on the show before. If you can find the embers of a forsaken star expansion, it greatly improves the game, but it's not needed. Normally, I only recommend the game for three players, but you know what? When you've got the time, go for five, go for six people, each grab your own ship. When the other players are playing, you can walk away and go do something else, go do some laundry, watch Netflix for a bit, and they can call you in the room when it's your turn. That's yeah. the kind of thing, when you've got the time, there's no need to rush it, no need for everyone to be completely focused on the game. Absolutely. But again, it really is. That Embers of a Forsaken Star really does make a difference. I've, I've just heard, yeah. you know, I've experienced it myself, and I've just heard too many other people saying that once you play with it, 
you won't ever want to play without it. So just be aware. Again, if you don't have it, there's no reason to not to, you know, to be upset. But once you get it, you're never going to play without it. It's not going to be something you pull out of the uh, out of thing. And yeah, as Dee mentioned, probably not too many people actually have six players trapped at home uh, with them right yeah. now. <laughs> if our entire family sat down, we'd have five. You can get my mom to play games now and then. I don't think she enjoys Zaya much, but Twilight Imperium, heck no. But and, and so that was Zaya Legends of Adrift with or without the Embers of a Forsaken Star. Oh, uh, just with. I, I don't even know if I recommend <laughs> it otherwise. No, it's not quite that bad, but it, it really is better. See if you can find a print and play version if you don't have it already. Uh, up next, Mage Knight. Now, I am not talking about the miniature skirmish game. I am talking about the uh, competitive deck building board game. This is a deceptively heavy game, and it has a learning curve. The first scenario in the game took us about six hours to play through, and it is actually just to teach you how to play. And it's one of those where it slowly introduces you things. Like It reminds me of an RPG adventure, because it's like you start wandering off, and you put like one dungeon out on the board, and then when you land on the dungeon, it tells you how dungeons work. And then it says, okay, put out a layer and put out a wizard's tower, and then when you get to them, it'll explain how those work so that it slowly introduces all the elements of the game. To play through the tutorial takes about six hours. Like, this is one of the most epic games. It's actually a really good game with some really neat stuff going on. It is deck building, so you start off with your powers, but when you go to that dungeon and defeat the monsters, you might get more cards. If you go to the Wizard's Tower, you can upgrade your deck. You're going to get experience points. You're going to slowly level up. It is very much a fantasy sandbox. It's, it's almost the fantasy Zaya, though the mechanics are completely different. It's more of a Euro. Uh, it's all about getting fame. And then you get into the full game and you can play it. There's multiple scenarios where like take over the towers or you can play it as a 4X game where you are literally going to discover the map as you play and every game is going to be different and it's a race to victory points. Fantastic game. The, the reason I recommend it for this is you're going to be stuck in here for a long time. You'll actually have the time and the willpower to actually learn to play because this is a big one. Like This is heavy. I like heavy games. I us learning in 18xx was easier than trying to learn Mage Knight. Like our first play of, of 1830 went smoother than our first play of Mage Knight. Uh, Mage Knight, I think, also has cooperative rules. And I have been told, though I haven't tried it myself, it is fantastic solo. All right. Well, uh, and that just just to give you an idea, it's listed as a 4.55. The ultimate edition yeah, is it's on uh, on board game uh, board game geek. So yeah. it's a 4.55 weight out of five. Yeah, that, that's beaten out uh, Food Chain Magnet and Veenhos and a whole bunch of other ones. Yeah, and as Ryan mentions, there is a deluxe edition, and that's the one Sean just looked yeah, up. The, that the it ultimate, now ultimate has all edition is, the, is what they call it, the 2018 ultimate, uh, Mage Knight Ultimate Edition. Yeah, which I'm tempted, but again, I don't play this, right? Now is my chance. Because normally, when am I going to break this out? I'm not going to bring this out to the local game store. When Sean's down from Hamilton, I'm not going to set up a game that takes us six hours to learn. <laughs> But that's why we're talking about these games now, because yep. you got the time. Why not get these great, they're great games. Just get them to the table. So that was Mage Knight. All right, the next one is a very shiny game, and that is Firefly the board game. This is another sci-fi sandbox style game where you've got a ship, you're out in the black, do what you want, sort of. Because Firefly, you do pick a mission to play through, which is, of course, based on the tv series i don't know if they actually had the license to the movie so i don't know if any of the, the stories are based on the movie it's at least based on the tv series it may also be based on the movie i'm not certain on that i only have the base game um where you basically have your ship you're going to go around you're going to find a crew and you're going to do you're going to do missions and the neat part is it does the whole firefly thing is some of those missions may be less than legal so you have to watch out for the protectorate and of course the reavers are flying around it's a really neat game but it can be ridiculously long especially if no one focuses on completing the mission, because that's one of the things with this game is you can get distracted. You can just get distracted building your crew, trying to find the right thing and running these missions. And it's what I used to call the talisman problem, where I always find by the time people go for the crown of command and talisman, they're way overpowered. They don't need to have waited that long. And they just keep killing stuff on the outer thing to get that little extra point of strength and craft. Fireflies like that. You're just like, oh, I just, if I could just get one more crew, or if I could just deliver this one more thing to get this one ship upgrade, Meanwhile, if you just rush for the the end and play the odds instead of getting there so you, like, you automatically pass all the die rolls, it can be a little quicker game. 
But then there's like, I don't know, 18 expansions for this thing that add more to it. And there's extra decks, and there's extra planets, there's extra boards. You can get a big, uh, I think it's silkscreen mat for the whole verse. It's crazy. Huge game. Firefly fans are going to love it. This is one you may want to leave set up overnight and return to. And heck, if you're having fun with it, you could just throw out that mission and just keep playing and come up with your own victory condition. Whoever makes whatever the first 10,000 credits or something wins. And so that is Firefly the Game by uh, Gale Force 9. There are 14 expansions, and the listed playtime is two to four hours. All right, next is one Sean Deanna and I play all the time on Board Game Arena. So that is an option for that one. And this is through the ages. Uh, this is by far my favorite civilization game. To me, it has everything I want in a civilization game except the map. That is the one part of this game that I feel is missing. I don't get that Sid Meier civilization feel without the map. But if I could just overlook that, this is a fantastic civ building game. Uh, one where you have to pay attention to multiple different things, trying to watch your government trying to improve your your basic resources while also building domestic buildings and making sure you don't ignore military because wow if you ignore military and other people don't you are in for a world of hurt yeah and with the there are also a number of different versions and so we are we are currently playing the through the ages a new story of civilization uh which is the re-implementation of the, uh, through the ages a story of civilization there are also a number of role versions of the game out mm-hmm. there uh there's plenty out there but yes yeah, so what we are playing is through the ages a new story of civilization yeah that is the only one that's currently in print too so if, if uh, you're there's a new one coming out this year though i think that's a continuation of the rolling right uh hold on let me just uh put up again here i need to uh, 2020 through the ages new leaders and wonders that sounds like an expansion uh, yes it is an expansion so yes yeah so they like said through the ages that new story of civilization is definitely the one i wonder if i'll add those into the bga version <laughs> yeah probably take them a year and a half yeah yeah so that is through the ages a new story of civilization and this year, the new expansion, Through the Ages, New Leaders and Wonders. Potentially this year. I, I would not trust a single release date yeah, at this point. True. Uh, up next, another epic game should be played two or three or four players, though designed best for two. And that has been called Lord of the Rings in the Box by many other people. That is War of the Rings. Now, I don't feel bad recommending this one, despite not having played it. I have at least read the rulebook, which is better than the last time we mentioned this game on the show. But everyone loves this game. This is the number one rated war game on Board Game Geek. It, uh, it might be number two, sorry, Twilight Struggle is still number one. It's just, it's not actually a war game. That's my own personal opinion. Uh, this one's like, again, looking like I've had people tell me it's going to take six to eight hours for your first play, just because there's a lot to learn and a lot going on. And just reading the rules, I can see it. Like, all the little miniatures mean something different. They look barely different from each other. Um, There's all these rules for when you can go to war, because it's all about when the different nations joined in the war. And you can do stuff like split up the fellowship so that when certain people go to certain areas, they can then push that forward. So if Strider goes to Gondor, or not, Boromir goes to Gondor, he can then make them get ready for war. But otherwise, they have to be attacked before they'll fight back. Like, it, it really takes a lot of the the story into the game, which I couldn't see. Like, it just looked like a, a version of Risk to be, to look at a picture of it, to be honest. And there's things like the Elven Rings, and they can switch sides, and the Ring Rays can fly anywhere on the board because they're on the, I don't know what they call the things they ride, if I, if I still had the miniature game. But anyway, War of the Rings, I'll admit, haven't played it. Maybe this will be a Friday night stream with Deanna and I sometime soon. But I, I I feel confident recommending it just by the number of other people who have told me this is an amazing game. But it's going to take a bit to learn, and it takes a long time to play. So great to play when you're stuck at home. Yeah, and that is, and it's actually, it's War of the Ring, singular, not War of the Rings, oh. plural. So War of the Ring and Second Edition is the current uh, version of that one. Yeah. Uh, it is the number four thematic game on all of Board Game Geek. With a number 12 rank overall for all games on board games. All games, yeah. Like, that's that's ridiculously high ranked. Like I said, it's supposed to be fantastic. So we're going to try it sometime soon. All as, right. As D points out, one ring to rule them all. Yeah. 
No, because all the rings are in it. The elven rings are part of the game. So I thought it might, I don't know. So this is part of the problem if I didn't finish my show notes. So I'm actually, I'm sure you can tell because I'm saying way too much about each game. I'm improving all this. So I didn't get to double check the names of the games. <laughs> All right, last one for the Epic Game list, and that is Dominant Species. And I think I'm only putting this on the list because I really want to play it while we're in quarantine because I haven't played that in too long. Uh, this is a game where you are going to take a species and evolve it from their base state, spreading out, adapting to different types of terrain and adapting what they can eat and living through ice ages and playing through a species evolving from, say, back, I think you're, you're literally supposed to be playing on Pangea when it starts. And the game is timed by the fact the Ice Age is coming and the various land terrain and the environs in the game start shrinking as it all turns into ice. So dealing with a shrinking amount of resources while trying to evolve your species. Uh, this is a, one of the best worker placement games I've ever played, which combines worker placement with action selection, where there are a bunch of different options for your species. Like you can, you can speciate, which is to propagate. You can evolve. You can move. You can spread your territory. A fantastic heavy euro game from uh gmt games who usually make war games i gotta admit it's kind of butt ugly because like instead of your species you have little cubes and cones and, and like for what it is and yes there's companies out there that replace all those with neat pieces but man is it a really solid game but again you're looking at three to four hours minimum to play last time we played at my friend jamie's house who introduced the game to me it was over five hours and we had to call it because it just it got too late at night we you know we started at eight o'clock like it's two in the morning we can tell your brother's gonna win let's just call it yeah it's uh it's listed as a two to four hour play it's a 4.0 weight uh now it has been it has uh, been re-implemented by two different versions there's the card game which so doesn't break well but there's Terrible. also dominant species marine, which is much, which is higher rated, although not as well rated. Yeah, the so. the card game is. I, I would say I, I don't want to say too much. Not to my taste at all. It, I, well, I it's not to a lot of people's taste, judging yeah, by I, judging I, by board I, game. It's, it's one of the game. I will not play that. I I hold my copy and warn the person who bought it. <laughs> like like I, it's one I might have donated, like to to a library or something. Right. But then other people might find it. I, I did not enjoy that game at all. Like, and Dominant Species is so good. I think that's part of it. Maybe if it didn't have Dominant Species on the box, I might have enjoyed it. But no, I, I that game was not to my liking at all. Um, the other one, I don't know. So that the, the water one? Marine, yeah. Marine, that I don't know at all. So again, that was Dominant Species, uh, 2010 game from GMT Games. And now we're going to move on to, rather than those games that on their own take forever the <laughs> legacy yeah. games where you stretch out multiple sessions but there's no reason you can't do those back to back very true and actually my first game on the list fits that very well because the first few games we did play them back to back so the good thing about legacy games so legacy games are one and done right most 99 percent of them despite the fact they may say otherwise you're going to play these games once and once you're done with them they're done and they usually require uh, 10 to 15 plays there are exceptions, obviously. And what better time to play a game where you're going to get in 10 to 15 games in a row to get the full experience than when you're stuck at home for an extended period of time. Like, this is your chance to play through a legacy game from start to finish and get the entire experience. And the rewarding part about that is you don't have that downtime between games where you forget the rules, you forget what's happening, or you forget even just the impact of what happened in the last game. Like, if you're playing... Well, you know, it's my first recommendation is going to be Risk, Risk Legacy. There is something that happens when you use three nukes in one fight. That is a huge change to the game. If that happens, and then you don't play the game till six months later, you're just like, oh, what are those new rules for that new thing? You just don't have that impact. Whereas if you sit down and play it again, right away, you're like, oh, now the new thing's happening, and we get to experience it. So yeah, my first game on the list is Risk Legacy. And literally, for the first few games at least, you can play two to three games in a regular game night. This is risk that you can finish in about 15 to 30 minutes for the first couple games because they did some really smart changes to the game. For one, it's based on victory points. First person to four victory points wins. So it's not about taking over the whole map. And then at the beginning of the game, everyone gets a victory point for free because anyone who hasn't won a game yet gets a victory point. Plus, you get a victory point for controlling your own base and while well, everyone gets a base. So your first game of Risk Legacy, you start with two points. You're halfway there, the first game. 
Now, once you start beating other people, you lose those points, and then a whole bunch of stuff changes, and this was the first Legacy game, and it's still fantastic. Like, I was blown away. I do not enjoy Rift. I'll play it. I'll play it begrudgingly. I hate the end condition. There's a modern version of Risk where it actually adds missions in and ways to get points and makes it a point-based game. That's better. But Risk Legacy is good enough that I am considering buying a second copy to play it with another group. The other thing with Risk Legacy, whether you may or may not want to do this, when you finish, you can keep playing. So you play through, I can't remember what it is, I think it's 12 games. Once you're done your 12 games, you now have a unique Risk board that you can play Risk on for the rest of your life that's different from anyone else in the world which I actually think is a really neat thing, but we never got that far. And I admit most people I know mounted theirs on the wall and don't play anymore, but I do like that that's an option, unlike other legacy games, some other legacy games. And this is one of the few games you'll find on our recommendations from Hasbro. <laughs> yep, that's true. Hasbro does own Wizards of the Coast and Avalon Hill, so it dep it's how they choose to yeah. brand their games is what it is. But that, that so this was Risk Legacy from 2011. Yeah. All right, next is the the big boy, the biggest box behind me over here. That is Gloomhaven. Uh, we talk about Gloomhaven almost every week. We live stream Gloomhaven. Uh, this is a fantastic game, one to four players. Again, here's a good solo game. If you're by yourself, I realize it's a lot of money. It is, but for the amount of gameplay you are getting out of this, we have been playing our Gloomhaven campaign since September 2018. It does not feel like we are even close to finishing this. Now, we do play irregularly once a week, and we definitely haven't played once a week. And I'm terrible at logging my plays, so I can't even tell you how many times we played or how many scenarios we've beaten. But I've been told it's on average about 100 plays if you win every one. And you're not going to win every one, because Gloomhaven is a much heavier game than most people think. This is not Hero Quest. This is not Descent. This is a very much a resource management hand management game it's a big cooperative puzzle to be honest it's a puzzle about how to how to how to solve each of the scenarios which are all very different it's not just beat up the bad guy this is one that i strongly recommend just because again you're going to get to play multiple times close together you're going to remember what happened you're going to get to know your characters and you're going to get to see the story evolve without those gaps in between so you don't have problems like our group gets together and go what were we doing where are we going next? And we have no clue. And we've had to start taking notes because we forget where our various story paths are. That's we need to, you know, we've, we've luckily got guys in the chair to help. And, yes. uh, you know, we can always check replays every once in a while to, uh, to double check. I, I think yep. we've only ever we've actually had to go back and check the replay once for sure. But uh, it has been done. Yes, it has. And so that is, of course, Gloomhaven. Uh, a little pricey, but well worth the money, especially. And that plays, you know, anywhere from one to four players. And right now, you know, it's it's the kind of game where, especially when you don't know how long you've got, uh, it's the kind of game that's uh, just great to go into. It's unlikely you're going to finish Gloomhaven before the quarantine ends, but who knows? All right, up next, I got three games. I'm going to go through a little quicker because I haven't played them. Again, uh, now and then, if, if I hear games where people talk about them all the time, so anytime I talk about best legacy games, stuff like that, people mention these, I want to throw them on the list just so I'm trying to cover all my bases. So the first is Betrayal Legacy. I know Danielle in our chat is a huge fan of this. People seem to really be enjoying this. I am really not a fan of Betrayal at House of the Hill, and I have heard this is way better than all of the versions of Betrayal at House of the Hill out so far. It rates better. I've seen it on Board Game Geek. The, the reviews seem to be good. I've had some really nasty experiences with the original. I'm willing to try this. It's just not one I own yet. So uh, uh, this is Betrayal House of the Hill, which I, I don't even know how to describe that game. It's so unique. It's a group of people going to a house, and while you're exploring the house, something happens, and what happens is randomly generated in the original game. And that could be there's a murderer in the house, or the house suddenly catches on fire, or something... The, the 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 ghosts show up or something happens and in the main game one of the players then has to like read the leave the room read the rule book and then the game changes and then the other players read their book and they have their own goals it's a really unique system that just doesn't always work whereas legacy seems to have fixed that um strong recommendation from everyone out there that is betrayal legacy all right next one is from stonemeyer games and that is charterstone uh, I am a huge fan of Above and Below, 
And this is supposedly like that, where you were doing an evolving story, where you were expanding your civilization and spreading out into the world and spreading your civilization, adding stickers to the map, playing for a full legacy game. Of all the ones we're talking about tonight, this is one I know the least about. So I'm just going to stop here and say a lot of people strongly recommend Star Charger Stone as one of the better legacy games out there. It's also one where you can get removable stickers so you can resell your copy or reuse it after you played through. Absolutely. It's uh, it's rated a 7.5 overall yeah. on uh, Board Game Geek, and that's with almost 10,000 ratings. So that's a pretty yeah. solid uh, number to go off of. And that is Charter Stone from 2017, coming from Stonemeyer Games. Designer Jamie Stegmeyer. All right, the last Legacy game I've got on my list for tonight is Aeon's End Legacy. Now, Aeon's End is a cooperative deck-building game where you're playing these, like, sorcerers who are trying to hold back evil horrors at bay and protect your... your. Oh, I forgot one. I'm going to... Sorry, there's going to be one more Legacy game after this. Um, and trying to protect your stronghold or your, your home base. Uh, the really neat part in this game is that, it's a, for one, it's a cooperative deck-builder, which you don't see. Uh, that often and second is you never shuffle your deck so it is all about stacking your deck so when you discard the order your cards go in you are just going to flip that deck over next turn which is a huge part of this game aeon's end and legacy takes that game takes it to the legacy extreme where what you do in scenario one is going to matter for scenario two you're going to add cards to your deck rip up cards and all the fun legacy stuff this is one i really want to try again strongly recommended by other people haven't had a chance to play it myself but recommended by enough people, I feel solid in recommending it myself. And this one also plays well as solo. Oh, We've got good one to know. Four player. It's been listed as best at two, but uh, it does have a solid number of ratings as a solo game. And so, next, last, last one on the uh, Legacy Games list. Uh, that would be Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. I love Clank, and I got to admit, I skipped over this game because I know nothing about Acquisitions Incorporated. Or to be honest, I didn't know anything about it. Since then, I've looked into it since the D&D &D book came out. I had no clue it's a Penny Arcade thing, and it's their home D&D &D campaign. Well, they added that to Clank, and I thought it was going to change Clank, but no, it's still Clank. It's just using the names and the, and the characters and the places from Acquisitions Incorporated in no way is knowledge of Acquisitions Incorporated required. You're still doing the same Clank thing, you're running in, you're trying to grab the treasure, you're trying to get out before the dragon bakes you, but you're also exploring a world and putting on stickers and adding cards to the deck and things like that. It sounds fantastic. I love Clank, and I actually am kind of kicking myself for avoiding this one. I probably shouldn't have. The Acquisitions Incorporated uh, theme on this doesn't change it from the base Clank. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this I, I've, I'm, I've really been interested in the Acquisitions Incorporated concept uh it sounds like a really fun way to uh to sort of change up not only clank but you know D, &D as well and uh it's got some uh powerful ratings it's an eight nine eight point nine wow on uh on board that's Game huge Geek right now uh that is ridiculous. overall it's 350 you know 357 overall on bga well, i'm and surprised it's, it's not higher with that rating and it's only uh i mean it's only been out for a year so <laughs> that one's probably gonna keep going up yeah so that was Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. And that was the end of our legacy games for those people who want to sort of play something that evolves and changes with your plays. Now, next up, we have something that you that where you're still playing for a long period of time in multiple sessions, but instead of necessarily changing things, you're just going on an adventure, sometimes with development, sometimes not. The campaign yeah, so game. Yeah, we've got campaign games and scenario-based games. I've, I've grouped them together. Uh, we do have an entire episode about campaign games. I don't have time to grab the episode number, but check that out. See what I mean by the difference between a campaign game and a scenario-based game. I do think they're completely different. This list is going to have both. And the reason I'm recommending these games are, of course, because now is your chance to play through a full campaign of these games. Now is your chance... To, to start from the beginning and get to the end or possibly play through multiple campaigns or try different branching paths. Um, we've got quite a few on this list. And we'll go through those, starting with um, something I thankfully got to review this year that I would have totally overlooked otherwise, and that is Cthulhu Death May Die. This is a big... Uh, is it Cool Mini or Not? Yep. Yeah, cool mini, yeah, big Cool Mini or Not miniature-based Cthulhu game 
that is so different from every other Cthulhu game out there, in my opinion. It's not about investigation, slowly going insane and trying to solve the mystery. It's about breaking down the door, losing your mind, punching Cthulhu in the face and shooting Sub Niggeroth with your shotgun. Very different style of game. I've had way more fun than this game than I ever expected to. The base box comes through five missions. It's five or six scenarios in the base box, but it also comes with two different Elder Gods. So you can try each scenario with each Elder God. Now, what I did find lacking in this game is there's no carryover. You could literally just play scenario five or you could play scenario one. You don't have to play them in order, order and there's no ongoing story, but it gives you an awful lot of replayability in one box. And again, great to play when you're stuck at home for a long period of time. You'll get to try every scenario with every god over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this one is such a fun game uh, and it does take a little bit of setup. So it's something that, you know, is nice to be able to have that time. And again, like some of the other games, if you've got something you can leave a little bit set up or, or out on the table, uh, there's a, a good bit of putting away and miniatures and things to it. So, again, yeah. of course, being a Simon game. So now is the time where if you can uh, dedicate some table space to it for a while, you just get a bunch of plays in, you're not going to be as bothered by the whole putting away and taking out mm -hmm. uh, again. All right, up next, a game we recommend far too often, but it's really good. That's Star Wars Imperial Assault. One player plays, well, it depends how you play. With the base game, one player plays the Empire, the other players play a group of heroes, plays up to five people, and you play through a 10-mission campaign with branching paths that is ridiculously replayable, especially if you add in expansions, because the resources to the Empire player are randomized, which side quests come up are randomized. Each character has their own side quest that's added into the deck. There are a ridiculous number of expansions for this game. And even better, if you don't like that whole one versus many thing, there's now an app that turns into a pure co-op game. If you get bored playing through the campaign, it also includes a skirmish mode, which is basically a really solid two-player miniature battle game. You're getting all that in one box. Like this is, We're going to recommend this game for the next 10 years, I think, at this point. It's going to come up every two to three shows because it just it covers so many areas. This is your chance to sit down and play a campaign from game one to game 10 and then maybe swap it up so someone else gets to play the dark side and go through it all again. There you go. That is Imperial Assault. All right. The Imperial Assault is part of a series of games with dungeon crawl games from Fantasy Flight, the latest of which is Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. This one is pure co-op that requires an app so you don't have any... Uh, you know, Dark Forces player in this one. It jumps right to the app. It's basically Fantasy Flight, took everything they learned from Imperial Assault, improved on it, threw on a Lord of the Rings theme on top of it. Uh, personally, I think go with whichever you think is cooler. If you're into fantasy, pick up Journeys of Middle-Earth. If you're into sci-fi, pick up Imperial Assault. Or if you're like me and like both, just buy both games. Again, that's Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. All right, next, I've got Mechs versus Minions, which is the other huge box behind me. This is one that a lot, not a lot of people have heard of. It is the most well-produced board game I've ever seen in my life. It's put out by the League of Legends people. The only way to actually buy it, well, technically you can buy it on Amazon. Don't do that. Go to the League of Legends site, and you can buy the game direct from them. For the cost, I've never seen a game with so much bits and so much production value for that cost. This is almost a legacy game because you unlock stuff and you rip open packages. But you don't make any permanent changes. You just rip open envelopes, and every envelope adds new elements to the game. It's a programmed movement game that's slightly different, and I gotta say more fun than Robo Rally. Now, I like Robo Rally for the strategy and thinking, and not like the. It's it's a different type of fun, where this is more random, run around, do silly things fun. Whereas Robo Rally is more try to plan out your moves kind of fun. I think this one's more accessible. Um, program is a lot simpler. And it's cooperative, which is also a very big change from other program games. You are working together to fight against the minions in your mech. Uh, we have never finished a campaign of this one. This is one that, again, we had a player who was part of the group that's no longer part of the group, so we never finished. Plus, Deanna, I got to admit, didn't like it. But she's not a fan of co-op games in the first place or program movement games. So that was two strikes before we started. But again, you're stuck in your home for a long period of time. Now is your chance to pick it up and play through the entire campaign and get to see all the cool unlocks that happen as you play through. Yeah. So again, this is Mechs versus Minions from Riot Games. If you want to buy this from Riot Games at the League yes. of Legends site, it is uh, a mid-weight game. It sits right in there, just under the 2.5 rate. It's best of four players. 
Uh, and each game should take you between an hour and an hour and a half per per session if you're yeah, it sounds uh, if you're about right. one off. Uh, and again, this is a really well rated game. Oh. I mean, there's it's not well known, but it is really well regarded by everyone who has played it. And every time I see it mentioned on Twitter, it's someone else going, Oh my god, this game is amazing. How I I can't How believe they it put only... this out for seventy five yeah. bucks. Exactly. Like seventy five so, bucks isn't cheap, but man, you gotta see this game. Like, yeah, I mean, like you're it easily is... looking at a hundred dollar plus worth of game for oh, yeah. seventy five bucks. Uh, if, this, if this was a cool mini game, you're looking like one fifty to two hundred easily. So that was Mix versus Minions, Riot Games. All right, next I've got Arcadia Quest. This is another uh, cool mini or not. We got a lot of cool mini or not campaign games. This is a PvP campaign game though, where each player is going to take a war band of fantasy characters and compete to win through campaign fights. And after you fight one scenario, it unlocks other scenarios. And there is carryover in this game, which is something I like. Now, it's not much. It's one of those, if you are the one, the winner, you get a little sigil. And then when you go to the next thing, you get a little bonus. But at least there's some carryover. Um, you can't just, you have to play them in order. Um, it's tiered where you play so many battles on the outside tier, and it shows you're actually raiding a castle. And then you do so many battles in the inside tier, and then there's a big final battle. Uh, Tom Vassal liked to call this game like to say it felt like Looney Tunes because it was just so back and forth where it's like, oh, I'm winning. No, you're winning. And oh, I hit you with my arrows. Oh, I pushed you back. And he, he, to him, it felt like Looney Tunes. I, I'll admit I didn't really get that out of it, but it is a really neat game. And I got to admit, I love the miniatures and I thought I would hate them because they are a very distinct chibi, chibi anime style that I think worked really great for fantasy figures. Like you're looking at goblins and orcs and trolls and elves and dwarves with the, their heads as big as their bodies. And I, I should hate it, but I love it in Arcadia Quest. I love the way the miniatures look in this game. Plus, they come pre-assembled, which is awesome compared to other games like that, like, say, Super Dungeon Explorer. Now, that was Arcadia Quest, but now I noticed that last year they came out with Starcadia Quest. Yes. Is this just the uh, the sci-fi retheme? As far as I know. I the, one of the, Again, the problem with playing Arcadia Quest is you have to play five or six missions in a row with the same group. And it's almost like they intend you to play all the same night. Like there is a little tracking sheet, but it's not good enough to track all the things, like all the things you have for your group. Right. And I think it's really set up to play like a 12 hour session from beginning to end at like on a tournament or something. And I just never did that. So because of the fact I never, ever finished a campaign of Arcadia Quest, I admit I ignored Starcadia Quest. Right. And I, I also there have the some other aspects you can integrate into Arcadia Quest. They talk about, uh, yeah, uh, I've never actually noticed it integrates with before, uh, but Arcadia Quest Inferno, Masmora Dungeons of Arcadia, and Masmora Dungeons of Arcadia Kickstarter integrates with. The yeah, Arcadia so Quest. There, there's also like I have the Forgotten Kings, which that's a whole new campaign, but then the dungeons let you, while you're playing the campaign, also go into the dungeons, kind of like the expansions for Talisman. So the games are not at all similar, but the kind of thing where you can go into the dungeons of Arcadia, and there's Arcadia Quest pets, so you can have like your Pokemon basically. Yeah. with you like there's a lot to it i just own i own the base game and i own the forgotten king expansion because i really like the look of the necromancer chibi figure was was the main thing all right well that was arcadia quest all right this is another one i own it i've read the rules uh i can say they're good rules they're they're overly complicated rules that try to cover every possible little situation and that is because it is a pathfinder game and that is pathfinder otherwise known as math finder by some people the Adventure Card Game. This is another deck-building game where you have a deck for your character. You are going to go on uh, what they call Adventure Pass, like RPG-like scenarios that all involve you searching through location decks to try to find quest, like the, the next step in the quest and eventually defeat some boss. Um, as you improve, you're going to add more cards to your deck. You're going to check off. You get feats as you evolve. This is as close as you're going to get to a role-playing game in card game format. This is one I think Sean and I would have loved back in the day. And again, though it doesn't require the same group, when you're playing through a story that tells a complete story, you kind of want the same people with you every time. So you all get to experience the same story together. And it is not a game where you can drop in and out unless someone dies. Someone can die and someone can make a new character, but there's no way to, like, Sean comes down for the weekend, here, come play Pathfinder with us. It just doesn't work. So this is why I'm recommending for this for when you're stuck at home for a long period of time, you can play through a whole adventure path. 
And there are plenty of adventure paths if you manage to get through the first one. All right, well, that is Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. All right, next is Legends of Andor, which is a game that totally deceived me because when I saw it, I thought it was another dungeon crawl game. It's got all these fantasy people, and I thought it was going to be a roll the dice and battle and fight the monsters, where in fact it is a giant puzzle. It's a giant cooperative puzzle using a medieval map where you start with a castle in the middle and something is happening in the land, which the first couple missions are monsters are raiding it. And the interesting part is the fact that it's all about only having so much time and each of your actions takes so much time before it's nighttime and trying to figure out the action economy and who should do what. And the main thing that made it feel like a puzzle to me was the fact that you have to take into account things like, well, we lose if five monsters go to the castle, so we're going to let four of them get there. And it was all about solving the scenario much more so than rushing out, fighting, and rolling the dice. It was, it was pretty much the opposite of Cthulhu Death May Die. This, this is a really neat cooperative puzzle game that, like, it's, it's from Cosmos, and like it most reminds me of the Exit game, in a way, like just the way your brain has to think. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a great fantasy co-op. Just don't expect a, a dungeon crawl on Arcadia Quest, a Cthulhu Death May Die. Right. That's Legends of Andor, and possibly sometime this year, we may see Legend uh, Andor Jr., which is oh, that's a more family version of Legends of Andor. And there are actually three chapters to Legends of Andor, and there are multiple expansions. I just have the base box. Uh, my last one is any of the Command and Color games. So we're looking at Memoir 44, Command and Color Ancients, Command and Color Napoleonics, Command and Color Medieval, any of those games, because all of them feature scenarios. So these are miniature, uh, miniatures are about a term. War games, uh, some use blocks, some use miniatures, that it's a card-driven war game. It is my favorite war games out there. I am not a Hex Encounter fan, but I love Command and Colors, where you are using a big hex board, you're using cards to determine where you're going to attack and which units you're going to move. All scenario-driven. You don't have to play them in order, but if you play them in order, it tells usually a historic story. Uh, there is also Battle Lore, which is a non-historic version where there are no campaigns. So that's the, re the reason I didn't mention Battle Lore before, is each game's its own individual game. Whereas the original Command and Colors games, you're going to play through the Siege of Rome, or you're going to play Carthage attacking uh, the Siege of Rome, or you're going to play through the Hundred Years' War, or you're going to play through a Napoleonic battle, or you're going to play the the landing on D-Day. And then you're going to play through the various battles through throughout. Again, I recommend this one strongly just because you can play that full campaign. You can get that full experience. It's not just a one-off where you're like, eh, let's pick this third scenario and play it. All right, well... Moving on from campaign games, a lot of those are, you know, 14 plus games necessarily. So now yeah. we've got some suggestions where you've got games for the whole family, games where you can uh, bring in your kids, uh, you know, as long as they're able to sit at the table for a little while and, and concentrate and focus, Yeah, we can bring them in on these games. Yeah, so if you're, if you're stuck home with kids, uh, we're stuck home with kids. If you've got kids at the table, there's no reason not to play some games with them at the same time. Now, this is sticking to the same theme of epic games or longer, not necessarily longer games, but games with multiple plays. So games that are going to take you a while to get to the end of. So games that, that are worth sitting down over multiple nights to play through. And we're going to start with one of Sean's favorites that he's further than we are in the campaign, and that is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, this is a... Was it two to four player or one to four player? Uh, two to four. You could, you could one more. You could, you could, you could one player it, but you'd be okay. doing the man, you know, multiple hand managing, and I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, that's not so great. So, so two to four player cooperative card game set in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Uh, it's almost a legacy game because you're unlocking bo books boxes which represent the books. After you beat book one, you open up the box for book two, which introduces new rules. Once you finish the main game, there's also now two expansions out to continue the story. Has the second one dropped yet? I don't know. I think it is. But yeah. I, I saw it for sale, but it might have been a pre-order. Right. But yeah, no, and this is uh, and this is not an easy game. It's a family game, but it's not a let's all be happy and beat it. You're good. Yeah. You, know, you will struggle, especially you know with kids uh, who aren't you know expert game players. There is there is uh, a real difficulty to it. Um, but it's fun because I, I think personally, I think it's more fun because there's a chance to lose. You know, mm -hmm. you're not walking through it. The kids get a little disappointed, but there's nothing wrong with learning, learning about disappointment in games. 
Um, and uh, it's really enjoyable to think about what you've uh, you've done and not done. That is, uh, again, Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, and there's a lot of replayability, even if you don't have the expansions. Uh, you know, once you finish that deck, you can just go back and fight the Dark Lord once again. Yeah, you can just keep replaying it with just the base set. And the other thing, too, is a suggestion, just if you are playing with younger kids, is play with open hands. That way you can help coach them on what cards to play. They generally, we generally recommend that anyway. I think game, the game plays that way sort of naturally. Yeah. So... All right, up next, I've got Mice and Mystics. This is a classic plaid hat game that tells the story of a prince cursed to turn into a mouse and his retinue. And you are playing small mice being chased by rats trying to reclaim your kingdom. One of the, the coolest themes, in my opinion, some amazing looking miniatures. The only caveat with this game is this is a little heavy. This one's for older kids, uh, younger, uh, at like grade school for sure later grade school to teens. Uh, but this is also one adults could also enjoy. It's more the theme that's child-friendly than the actual game and the mechanics. This is one where the parents are probably going to help out. It is basically a dungeon crawl. It's an Imperial Assault. It's a Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth with, you know, all that goes with it, with rules for line of sight and rules for ranged attacks and close-up attacks. But this is cooperative, which is perfect for that. And uh, there are uh, any number of expansions available for it as well. Uh, now, they say, community says eight, uh, ages eight and up. Uh, I would find that a little rough. Like, uh, we started too early with this game, and I've now shelved it to bring back out. I'm now at the point with my kids being t 13 and 10, 12 and 10. <laughs> I could do the math some other time. 12 and 10 at this point. Yeah, 12 and 10 at this point. That, that I think they're possibly, probably ready now to, to give it another shot. Yeah, it is a midweight game. It's a two point six. So, yeah, that's that's up. That's above Race for the Galaxy. Yep. Right. So I I wouldn't want to try to teach my kids Race for the Galaxy at this point. And that was Mice and Mystics. All right. Up next, this is another game from Plaid Hat, which is their evolution, and this is what I recommend for younger kids, and that is Stuffed Fables. If I thought the theme for Mice and Mystics was cool, this blows it away. You are the toys protecting a girl who's spending her first night in the big bed from the monsters under her bed. It is a what they call a storybook game where you're going to fold out the book. It's a spiral book, and on one side is going to be your map to play on, and on the other side is the rules for that scenario. Extremely well done, varied tales, uses a neat dice pool system. This one definitely ages A+. Plus. I probably could have started younger with my kids, and I actually recommend this one over Mice and Mystics if you have younger kids. All right, and that was Duffed Fables. All right, next, I got Talisman Legendary Tales. We're going to be talking a lot more about that in our review segment. But this is a five-scenario campaign, very loosely based on the original Talisman universe with some tie-ins to that. It is a cooperative bag builder for the entire family. So uh, just remember that this is not Talisman. This is Talisman yeah. Legendary Tales. This is not your father's Talisman. <laughs> Uh, and so that was, that was uh, our selection for the the family games for those of you who've got uh, you know some younger kids not young but younger. Uh, and next up we've got some games that I think we've talked about a lot. Most people who listen to this show are going to be pretty familiar with, but are yeah. still really good because you can play them over and over again. Yeah. So this is going to be very subjective compared to the other stuff. Not that any reviewer or or, or, cons or any recommendations we say aren't subjective. But these, to me, are more subjective than the rest. These are games I personally never get sick of playing. So this is the, these are games that I think have extremely high replayability. And we're going to be a little short on the description on most of these because these are games we've talked about before. So I'm going to group a couple together to start, which is Azul and Sagrada. These are both engine-building games where you are drafting things and putting them onto your personal player boards in order to score points abstract games that have almost universal appeal i've yet to find someone that totally hates either of these games they're nice quick play time but they're strategic and deep enough that like i'm still learning things in azul how i could be playing better and then sagrado with its various tools and the different windows is so different every time you play it that's what really ups the replayability on that one absolutely and i think with azul i think we, we're including all three versions in this yes. one uh now our favorite right now is the summer pavilion yeah. Uh, while Azul, the original, still is a fantastic game. Now, I think that Stained Glass of Sintra is a game where when you've got more time, I'm actually sure. more interested in playing that. You know, if uh, if I am stuck at home, 
yeah. I'd be more willing to put a stained glass of Tintra out there to really delve into it and learn some fair. of the ins and outs. Yeah, fair. It's a, it's a game that would take some time to master, and this now's your chance to get that mastery. Yep. I agree. Uh, up next, one of my favorite card games of all time, Race for the Galaxy. If you haven't played it before, having lots of time might be good for learning all those icons. Uh, despite that, it's still one of my favorite games of all time. It is one of the best two-player games ever made, in my opinion. Um, I personally think you need to have the Gathering Storm expansion to really make the game. But the base game on its own works. Uh, 4X, done with cards. Uh, plays like up to seven players. I doubt you have that many people stuck in your house. But if you do, it's one of the few games it does. But that's only with the expansion. Base game plays five. Every expansion adds another player. Uh, they say uh, two, to, two to four is uh, base game. The base game. Oh, sorry. I guess the base game is four. See, I'm saying add Gathering Storm. Then it plays five. <laughs> Gathering Storm just rebalances the deck a lot better. And it adds it adds some rules that I found were missing from the original game. It gives you something to aim for. It gives you those goals at the beginning of the game. Uh, this is another one you can play for free on Board Game Arena, which we do constantly. I currently have three games going. I haven't had a, a race for the galaxy game going in ages. Oh, well, we got lots going. I don't even know who's in them anymore. So. <laughs> uh, I, I and I do the role for the galaxy. Another one, which is another one. Yeah. With high replayability, you know, over and over again. Yeah, roll's another good recommendation. I just prefer race, but yeah, roll could be on this list. Uh, I think honestly, for for playing at home, I think I would rather play race. There's something about playing a card game when you're sitting around, sitting yeah. around the house. But uh, that was race for the galaxy. All right, next, Carcassonne. I think everyone knows this tile laying game. I don't know why I don't get sick of this game. I haven't played this game since, like, it came out in the year 2000 or so. So I've had, like, 20 years of playing Carcassonne, and I'm still not sick of it. You'll note I don't have Catan on this list, but I do have Carcassonne. And one thing to say about Carcassonne, the digital version is phenomenal. So yes. even if you don't have Board Game Arena, if you can pick up the D digital version, you can play with people no matter where they are, even if you're all stuck at yes. different homes. It is a fantastic implementation of the game though in that case everyone does need to own it that's true that that is the one disadvantage of the asmodee digital version on steam speaking of steam if you want something heavier that has like has people hooked steam is a pick up and deliver train game or rail game uh there's steam and age of steam they're basically the same game steam is slightly simplified this is one of the best heavy games that's ever come out in my opinion um, I, I love this game for what it is. There is the base rules, there's the expansion rules that add some, or not the expansion, the, the advanced rules that add an auction mechanic. You're looking at it, if you want a heavier economic game and you're not into 18xx, that's the next step. Steam is that step below an 18xx. If you even run out of maps, you can go online and print and play maps for Steam. There have got to be a hundred different maps for Steam out there, including officially published ones and non-published ones. The maps for Age of Steam are compatible with Steam, so whichever version you prefer. I personally own Steam. Love it. Um, the base game, you can finish a game in two hours. But then, depending on what maps you play with, you can make it a lot longer. It is a game that I honestly think is infinitely replayable if you like train games. If you like that style of game, there's always something more. And, like, I don't even get sick of playing on the base map, which the base game comes with two maps, two-sided. And so that was Steam or Age of Steam from Mayfair Games not the online digital store. Yes, not the store. Uh, next, Terra Mystica. The main reason I am throwing this on the list is because of the number of factions in that game. I don't even remember how many is it. Is it 13 or 12 or whatever yeah, it is? I think it's 13. There are a ridiculous number of factions. So here's your chance to try every faction in Terra Mystica and figure out which is your favorite. Also, I love the game. I am a big fan of the game. The replayability and the asymmetry in the replayability of this game really makes it uh, a game that's that's great to go back to time and time again. Even if it's the only game you've got in your house, you can still yep. get a lot of play before you're tired of it. And man, the more you play, the, the tighter every game is going to get as people start to master the various rules. That was Terra Mystica. All right, next is Tales of the Arabian Nights. This is a very unique game. You have a big map, and you're like the Age of Sinbad, and you are going to wander around the map and encounter people, and using a Which Way book, things are going to happen. That's about the best way I can describe it. You're going to have this weird, epic adventure where you met people and got robbed by beggars and then went on a ship and went out to an island and fought a kraken and then turned into a woman and then returned home and got married. Like, it is a really big epic game that takes a long time to play because 
the end game scoring is terrible. So you just throw it out, decide you're going to play Tales for the Arabian Nights for six hours, then everyone's going to have this weird epic experience and story that you'll be able to talk about for the weeks to come. That is Tales of the Arabian Night from Zedvan Games. All right, next is Terraforming Mars. It is my most played game of 2019. I don't know how. I don't get sick of this game. I, I love Terraforming Mars. It's probably my number one game. I should probably stop saying it's Shogun because I played way more Terraforming Mars than I've ever played Wallenstein or Shogun. I, there's something about that game that just keeps it. I, it's always interesting. Um, make sure, since you've got the time, use the drafting variant because it does improve the game strategically and tactically, remove some of the random elements of the game. And this is another one where there is a great digital version. I've already seen people uh, on uh, on Twitter and, and board game Twitter calling out, hey, we've got two people playing. We, we, we could use a third person to play yep. Terraforming Mars on Steam. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a quick game, so it's no. not something I would recommend doing while you're working from home. But yes. after work, go ahead and jump in. And, uh, and, and, that, uh, and it also has the solo version built in. So yeah. if you want to work on your Terraforming Mars skills, that solo game is really hard. It's not something you're going to win first time or 12th time. I'm, I think I've tried. <laughs> I'm not very good at the solo game. <laughs> yeah, and actually the, the board game itself does play well solo as well. Yeah. So that is a solo recommendation we'll throw out there. Uh, next is basically Magic the Gathering. I put down, but any CCG, because all of those deck building games are all about learning your deck, learning your opponent's deck, and slowly tweaking until you can beat each other. And I think when you've got an extended period of time, back when I was into Magic, I'll admit, I don't play it now, we could play game after game after game. When we were at the University of Windsor, I would play 6 to 20 games of Magic in one day. Like, we'd sit down and play this person, then play this person, then I'd tweak my deck, and i put one new card in, i put another new, oh, I, this didn't quite work, I need a different mana balance, and we just kept playing. Yeah. So I think it's a great game, as long as you have access to get the cards, but you could be playing online, Plus, lots of people do it, just print and play. Like, there are magic card generators out there. Use proxies. You don't necessarily have to go out and buy all the cards to play these games. So Magic the Gathering, but also any of them. Like, if you want to dive into Android Netrunner, here's a great chance to try an asymmetric game. Or if you're into Feudal Japan, you could pick up the Legend of the Five Rings living card game. There are a ton of these out here. And especially if there's only two of you, it's a great dueling game. Any of these deck-building dueling games, Sorcerer even for White Wizard games, Now's your chance to figure out your favorite combo of lineage, sorcerer, and domain. Uh, and the other thing I would I would add on to this, as again I'm going to go with the digital version, is Ascension. Uh, again, I don't I'm I'm not a fan of Ascension as a a card game unless you're just playing with the base or maybe the first expansion, yeah. uh, because it gets unwieldy. But the digital version is fantastic, and not only can you do uh, online play, solo play, but you can do passive play as well. I believe, correct? Yes. Yep. So with, at least on the phone app. Yeah. yeah so so if you've it. got the you know if you've got an iPad or something, you got you can sit around at home and, and play it just that way. Uh, I've just recently gotten back into it and realized I'd forgotten most of the cards that I'm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I started again back at the uh, at the beginning, uh, just playing online or offline to uh, to re reintroduce myself to the game because it's just been a long time and. I'm so now we could probably go on for another hour with great games to play when you're stuck at home. But instead, what I'm going to recommend is check out some of our previous podcast episodes, like our game recommendations. We've got all kinds out there. Like in particular, one of the topics we've covered quite a few times is two-player games. So we do have an entire thing about um, two-player games for date night. Most of those are going to work, even if your date night's at home, at the kitchen table together. We've also got uh, cooperative games, two-player cooperative games for people who prefer co-op games. And then also gaming with kids. We've got a number of different episodes and articles at the Tabletop Bellhop blog on gaming with kids, including the best games for gaming with your kids, games to hook your kids on gaming, two-player games with kids. We even have a specific one for three-player games playing with a toddler. There are all kinds of our past episodes, basically any of our game recommendations. Look for your situation. If you have five players only, we've got an article about that. And if you've got people who you don't normally play games with, but you're trapped in that house, look at our article for gateway games to try and figure out ways yes. to introduce them into your hobby. Yeah, we do have a whole uh, list of games to hook a new gamer. So uh, we've got games for people, tile laying games, I think, for people who like dominoes. We even have one of those. So 
check out some of our previous game recommendations. Like I said we could probably talk all night at this point about other games that are great to play when you're home. But the point is, you're stuck at home. It's not the end of the world. This is the perfect chance to sit down and play some games. And to me, it's the perfect chance to get those bigger, heavier, longer games, those games that require the same group of people get together all the time, or that take so many hours, you normally can't fit them into a regular game night. And as always, our uh, all of our episodes that we mentioned in this episode will be linked in the show notes for quick and easy reference down down below. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with always new things in the works, so now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. This is a weekly newsletter that I send out, recapping all the content we released in the week previous. You can sign up at newsletter.com tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, this week we're going to continue taking a look at our revised Patreon project. Today we're looking at our milestone rewards. These are levels that are open to every single one of our Patreon backers at all tiers and levels. Uh, these rewards are for longtime patrons, are based on our supporters hitting a monetary threshold over time. These thresholds are currently at $300, $750, and $1,200, and will be expanded as time goes on, if necessary. Once you hit a threshold, we're going to send you something in the mail, a special milestone reward that Deanna will be picking out. In addition, you'll get to pick one of the concierge services we talked about last week. Now remember, to earn these rewards, you don't have to do anything. Just be a patron at any level, and be patient. And stick with us for the long haul. All right, at this point, I am sorry to announce, though I think most people have heard this already, the Breakout Con has been officially postponed until further notice. As of right now, like most people, we have no idea what our convention plans are going to look like going forward. At this point, Origins is still on, but they have set a deadline date where they will cancel or not. Uh, there's a good chance there's no Gen Con this year. So it's going to be an interesting year for con season. At this point, we have no clue where we'll be going forward. We'll be sure to keep you posted as we learn more. The situation will be evolving for a long time to come, I think. Yeah. And one other impact of the COVID virus, of course, is we have to put our Gloomhaven live streams on hold. At this point, we uh, are not going to have Tori and Kat over to our house. Um, we are talking about a couple possible ways to do a video stream uh, playing remotely. We're not sure if that's going to work. And I don't know, honestly, if we're going to replace that with something else that will stream something else on Friday nights. Right now, it's kind of up in the air. But do not expect to see our Gloomhaven streams on Friday. We will let you know when and if they do come back. Well, I'm sure they will eventually. I said it should have been in the announcements. I screwed up. Okay, I don't know ahead. if you want to edit it and cut it and put it in the announcements. We can go ahead. That sounds like work. All right, I uh, didn't expect to be talking about this one again, but we need to talk about our medium giveaway. Because at this point, we still haven't heard back from one of our two winners. One of them I have, Aaron, we'll get your game out to you as soon as I can. I just want to only make one trip to the post office. But Don, Don, if you're out there, check your inbox. Make sure tabletopbellhop.com is whitelisted on any spell filters. I'm not sure what's going on here. So normally at this point, um, we usually get people like 48 hours to reply. But you know what? With everything going on in the world right now, we're going to be a bit more lenient. If we haven't heard that back from Don by next week's show, we will be drawing another winner. Up next, a review of the family game Talisman Legendary Tales from Pegasus Hill. All right, up first, in the efforts of being transparent, I did receive a review copy of Talisman Legendary Tales from Pegasus Spiel at Origins 2019, and I almost had to sell my soul just to give it to them. For them to give it to me. I literally begged for this one. Talisman Legendary Tales was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zock and features art by Zat. I'm guessing this is someone like the Miko who has a cute name. Cute. Uh, that sounded demeaning. I don't mean it that way. A, a moniker instead of the real name. Unless someone out there is actually named Zat. It was first published in 2018 by Pegasus Spiel here in North America. 
It's a cooperative game that plays one to six players in about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on who you're playing with and how much time they take. Best way for anyone to see what you get with a copy of Talisman Legendary Tales, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. We'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes. Now, I'm not going to go through every bit you get in the box. I do want to comp... Well, uh, I do want to comment on a couple of things. First off, the game has an excellent rule book. Very quick to read, plenty of examples. Component quality is pretty much top-notch with some of the best drawstring bags I've ever touched in a board game. You get seven of them. If I hated this game, I would steal them and put them in other games that need drawstring bags. Finally, both myself and my girls really appreciate the fact that every character in the game comes with male and female presenting versions. And that's a great touch. Well, uh, tell us a bit about how you play Talisman Legendary Tales. All right, so this is a cooperative game with five scenario, a five-part scenario-based campaign. And what I mean by scenario-based campaign is that they are meant to be played in order, but you don't carry anything over from one scenario to the next. So there's no like leveling up or anything like that. Now, each scenario can be played at level one, two, or three. And somewhat interestingly, you don't unlock new scenarios until you hit a certain star threshold based on those levels. And why I found this odd, especially for the first scenario, is you can't unlock scenario two until you beat scenario one at level two. So I'm not even sure why they offer level one for the first one, because you play level one and then just have to play it again. Though, once you get through the first one, it kind of makes sense, because to unlock scenario three, you need four. And you could do that by beating scenario one at level three and scenario two at level one or both at level two, but overall it's just kind of weird that you even have this level system. So no matter what, you're in for some repetition before you advance through, unless you're willing to jump in at the highest level. Yeah, not even the highest, just at the at level two. As long as you do level two every time, you can unlock everything. Now, the goal of each scenario is to find a talisman. So your overall goal for the campaign is to find five talismans. In each individual scenario, you need to do it before time runs out. And each story has its own, um, each scenario has its own story about where to find each talisman. And these are all actually rather well-told stories. Like they're very involved and they're all very different. To set up each scenario, you set up the map, which is a bunch of hex tiles. And then you seed it with encounter tokens based on like where it says in the rule book. Like the forest gets two and the caves get one and the, the, the fairy circle gets three. Then each scenario then has a board made of thick card. Again, you're at that Terraforming Mars style card, but for, it, it works for this game. You then take this card, one of the players is going to start reading it, and it's going to give you any additional setup and tell you what your objective is and where your characters start. And it always starts with having to go out and encounter those various tokens you put out, and then somehow through them unlock the next part of the scenario. And exactly what you're doing is different. You may be trying to find herbs you may be trying to hunt down goblins you might be trying to find a dragon and kill it it's all different based on the scenarios now each step in the scenario is going to add something new to the story and you'll often need to seed the board again with more tokens and this is unique because what they use is basically i spy or where's waldo or whatever they call that nowadays where it's going to tell you to put tokens on map tiles that have a specific symbol and in some scenarios which symbols are used are actually different based on what you did in the first part, which is kind of neat. And they can be randomized because of it. So depending on what you collected the first time might change where you're going to put stuff for the second part of a scenario. That sounds like a fun task for kids. But for those of us a bit older whose eyes are starting to go, maybe a little less ideal? Yeah, once I get into my summary, um, I basically state exactly that. Personally, I would have really liked a reference sheet that just told me where all the symbols were so I can sit back and let my kids find them. And then when they get frustrated, they can't find them. Just go, oh, no, just, have you checked the tower yet? You know, that would have been a nice touch. Now, on your actual turn playing the game, you're going to roll a die and move. So you got roll and move. Uh, the die is unique. It has a one, two twos, a three, and a four. The four has an hourglass symbol on it because it takes time if you move too far. And then a special portal symbol that lets you teleport. You're going to move around the board. You can ignore face down tokens, but if you see a face up one, it stops you. So it's just kind of like if there's a monster there, you have to stop and face it. Once you're done moving, you're going to flip up any of those tokens and then encounter them. Now, the encounters usually involve monsters or other hazards that you have to overcome, though sometimes it's like treasure chests you're trying to open. And the way you beat all these is you draw chips out of the player's bag. 
Now, every character has a unique bag with seven chips in it, and you're going to build these during the game. So you're going to pull them out, you're going to pull three of them, and look at the symbols on the chips. If the symbols on the chips match the symbols on the encounter token, you can defeat it, and then you get to draw a new chip from a treasure bag, which is a standalone bag, and then that chip can be given to any player, which is a nice co-op aspect. Now, some of the chips do other things, like there's one that will advance the time token, which is a bad thing. If you run out of time, you lose. There's another one that's like draw a chip and draw an extra chip. And then the neatest one is there's one that'll let you draw a chip from another player's bag. And then, of course, the treasure chips have all kinds of other special abilities. Now, as an added level of tactics to the game, whenever you are supposed to draw from your bag, you have the option to put your chips that have already been drawn, basically your discard pile, back in. And there's a lot of tactics to this trying to figure out what's still left in your bag and what's already out. Like, if all your time tokens are already got out, why not keep drawing? But if you really need to get a sword, which is combat, or, or a helmet, which is the magic or craft and strength, if you really need a craft and your only craft is out on the table, you're going to have to refresh your bag before drawing. So it seems like they chose to go with the nice bags to allow them to get some heavy use in, especially mm -hmm. with littler hands that may be a little less deliberately gentle. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, actually. I hadn't thought of that. They, I said they are high-quality bags. They are nice. Like I don't think they're silk, but they're silky. <laughs> Put it that way. So you continue doing this, going around the board, having encounters, and improving your characters by adding treasure chips to your bag while trying to complete whatever the scenario objective is before time runs out. Because each scenario has a time track, and the length of that actually varies. Now, it is worth noting, there is no death in this game. Your characters can't die. And the monsters don't really fight back. It's just all about how much time everything takes. So your penalty for not killing a monster is you might have drawn a time token. Or when it's your turn, you might have rolled the four on the dice and advanced the time token. You only actually lose if time runs out. Well, I'm a big fan of games that are aimed at, aimed at a certain age not having player elimination, especially in a co-op setting, etc. So now that we've got a rough idea of how to play, what did you think of Talisman Legendary Tales? All right, I've got to admit, the first time we played Talisman Legendary Tales, this was all four of us, Deanna, both my girls and I, I was not impressed. No, neither was Deanna. This game was almost nothing like the Games Workshop game I grew up and loved, grew up on. Yes, there are talismans, and yes, you're rolling and moving, but they're really, in, in scenario one, there wasn't anything else in common with the original game, and I found that highly disappointing. Now, to be fair, how long had it been since you last actually played Talisman? Could there be some fond memory of the game that, that's sort of rose-colored glasses? Uh, uh, Talisman is definitely not a great game, <laughs> to be honest. I'll admit it. No, I've, I've played it since the kids have been born, so I haven't played it with the kids. So it hasn't been too long. But to be honest, Talisman has a lot of flaws with it. The original game does have a lot of flaws from with it. Things like random, getting close to... Any game that has a, a thing that resets you to zero is terrible. And Talisman has that. You can be playing along and advance your character and almost ready to win, and all of a sudden you get turned into a toad, and you just lose everything. And it's a game that I honestly think is is it's fun for the first hour, it's fun for the last hour, but those four hours in the middle kind of suck. So it is not my favorite game, but I, there are elements of that game I wanted to see because I do have fond memories. Of it. I loved it as a kid, but I didn't know better. Plus, it, I was a kid, I had time. So maybe Talisman should be on our list for games to play when you're stuck at home. Because you have that six hours to play. And and you 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 get that final victory at the end, and those six hours might feel worth it. But my cousin and I played Talisman so much. We once played over an entire weekend where we decided our goal was we were going to kill every monster in the adventure deck. And that took us until Sunday, playing every night. It was insane. Uh, so I do have fond memories of it, but I was just expecting this to be a modern, better version of Talisman. And really, there's not as much as I had hoped in common. This is not a new talisman, a modern talisman. It is a game with talisman trappings. And that really disappointed me the first time. Plus, I expected a heavier game. I did not realize how light this was going to be. Yes, I knew it was a family-friendly game, but I was expecting something of a uh, Stuff Fables level or a Mice and Mystics level, something with a little bit more meat to it. Well, one thing, one thing I note is uh, the game says 14 plus on it. Uh, which is very obviously their way of getting around safety features. Yes. Because the community on Board Game Geek very loudly says 6 plus. Like, yeah. this is not a game for 14 plus, except for the fact 
They didn't have to do the safety testing. They said no, that. The, that, that is a common thing with board games, to be honest. That is a very common thing. Yeah, six plus six would be pushing it. Six, you would have to help. Six would be, yeah, you get to pull stuff out of the bag. Let's see what you got. But I'm going to move you over here. <laughs> kind of gameplay. Now, what I did find, though, despite, like I said, really not liking the game at first. I like I, I don't want to, I, I can't stress that enough. Like, it was enough that I was like, oof, I don't know if I even want to play this again. I did find over time, I think a big part of it is getting past Scenario 1. Uh, scenario 1, which introduces the game, I think was a little more friendly than later games. That my feelings on the game started to change. For one, the more I played, the more little bits of talisman that I started to notice. Uh, things like the treasure chips. Those are actually, every single one of the treasure chips is either a fo follower or an item from the original game. And they all kind of do similar things. Like a mule lets you carry more stuff by drawing more chips out of your bag. And the priestess lets you draw an additional token whenever you draw magic. And like they all actually kind of tied in. And the fact, yeah, it's a sword and a helmet. If I call them strengths and craft, it does feel more like it. And the one in particular, Scenario 3, felt distinctly more like the original game. Because this one, you were going up against a boss monster. Two of them, actually. And there's no way you could beat them with your base characters. But in that scenario, there's treasure chests hidden all over the map. So you were literally wandering around the map, trying to defeat monsters and level up to go fight the big boss. And to be honest, that's pretty much the original Talisman, summed up really quickly. So since you don't level up between scenarios, they force you to level up within them. Yes. Which is a workable solution. Yeah, it's definitely a standalone game. Like, I honestly don't see any reason you couldn't play them out of order, except there's an arbitrary rule that says you have to earn so many points to unlock the next scenario. Like, there wasn't, there is a slightly ongoing story. Maybe if I get to the end, it'll be a little, like, maybe I'll see more of the ongoing story. But so far, all three of the scenarios could have been completely different. Now, I am saying this is similar to Talisman, but don't get the wrong idea. It started to feel a bit more like Talisman. It's still not at all the same game. Uh, for one thing, this game is super light. Like, I think it's a 1.1 on board Game Geek. You don't get much lighter than that. This is a family weight game that is probably not going to have enough meat for most gamers. Plus, it's a co-op game, which is completely different from the classic Games Workshop game, which is really a take-that-very-competitive-stab-you-in-the-back kind of game. Yeah, this is not an antagonistic dungeon crawler. No, not at all. This is a happy, friendly, let's go explore the forest and maybe kill some goblins. But the important question, I think, is, though, is to throw out the talisman name, right? How does Legendary Journeys, Legendary Journeys? I can't even remember. Legendary, Legendary Tales, Tales, sorry. How does Legendary Tales stand on its own? And in that regard, I think it does an admirable job for what it is. A light fantasy romp that's playable by and with the whole family. I think it's an excellent game. But more importantly, my kids have loved it. Like Sean mentioned earlier, my kids even love the I Spy element of the game. I personally it drove me nuts. And Deanna, I think, was willing to flip the table while we couldn't find one fairy the first time we played. But man, my kids love it. Where, where, Where's the one spot that has a mushroom, a fairy, and a bone? Where's the one spot? We got to find the goblin base. Like, come on. Personally, I just want to look up and go, okay, here's a chart of all the territories. What has a bone, a fairy, and a mushroom on it? Okay, there it is. It's the ruins. Let's go. But hey, I didn't want to ruin their fun. They, the kids had fun doing it. Now, is it playable by the kids on their own? I think at this point, my kids could play it on their own. I think it would matter mainly on the age group. The most difficult part is the seeding, the setting up. And if it's if this is the same problem that some of the um, older Arkham Horror games have and Mansion of Madness have. If you put something in the wrong place, you may be able to not complete a mission. Or if you forget to put a token out. So it's just that attention to detail. So it's going to very much depend on your kids. If your kids have that attention to detail, if they're really good at following the instructions by far, it's going to be great. I'll admit my kids are not there because the reason um, we lost scenario three multiple times is someone didn't read the full paragraph and stopped a little early and we completely missed the special rule that was in play because she didn't read far enough. She didn't have that attention to detail. She was like, oh, we put our stuff on the map. Oh, now we got to fight these goblins. Okay, so that's what we're doing is fighting the goblins? Yeah, we're fighting the goblins. And we start playing through and fighting the goblins. We're like, hey, we killed the goblins. All right, we won. Continue reading. He goes, special rule. The goblin boss does this. Ooh, oops. <laughs> so I, at, at this point, I think my kids could play it on their own because now um, Big G has learned that she needs to spend a little more time paying attention to what it says and not assuming the way things go. But again, it's going to be very de dependent on your kids. How is it as a two-player game, do you think? I would work. I don't. I don't see any reason why not. So you don't play multiple characters. 
you can play solo. This is yeah, solo. It's, it's one one to six players yes. as a base game is an interesting yeah. count. Yeah, one to six players because it basically it's one of those games where because the monsters don't attack, it's just based on what you do on your turn. It doesn't matter. Uh, it reminds me of like uh, Shadows Over Camelot. We're on your turn. Everything's going to happen. So if a player's there or not there, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. So the only way to get the hourglasses are by players drawing things out of their bags or rolling the dice. By more players, you're not going to increase the number of hourglasses. It's still on every player turn, there's going to be an equal chance. Like I, I think it's actually kind of perfectly scalable that way. What I think would be difficult is arguing over who gets those treasure chips once you're up to six players. <laughs> and that's going to be the bag building aspect, maybe a bit difficult because you're, you're thinning out that resource. But as long as your players are cooperating well, it should be a matter of, hey, you're going to focus on strength, you're going to focus on craft. Now, all of us really enjoyed the cooperative element. So this is a couple things they built into the mechanics that make the game cooperative that I like. Because every character has a chip in their bag that lets you pull a chip from another character's bag, which I thought was really neat. Because this mechanic alone makes it feel like your characters are working together. And a perfect example is I'm playing the wizard. I go up and I draw a goblin that has two swords. My wizard only has one sword in his bag, but the troll has three swords in their bag. So if I can draw my draw from someone else's pouch, I'm going to ask the troll to help me. And I thought that was a really neat mechanic. Plus, there's also the added fact that whenever you get a treasure ship, you can put it in any character's bag, which also increases that co-op feel. Yeah, I must say the idea of sharing aspect is interesting and much different than what you see in most like co-op deck builders, mm -hmm. where you're working together, but you're really focusing on what you can do exclusively generally uh, in order to make yourself better for the, for the good of yeah. the party rather than what you can do or how you can help others and, and, and sort of, you know, literally physically help others with, with bits. No, I, I totally agree. And that, that's one of the, the shining highlights of this game. Like I've yet to see a game do that. And the fact you've got the bag builder where you can ask other people for help basically really ties the cooperative field together. Now, of course, there's the disconnect that your character's standing over here and mine's over here. How am I getting something out of your bag? But you know what? We just ignore that. It is You're a throwing game. throwing it. Throwing it. Yeah, there you go. We're throwing it. Now, the one thing I do want to talk about is replayability, because this is what's going to scare people. This game only comes with five scenarios, and you are going to play one scenario when you sit down in one play. We played four games tonight, so that shows how often you can play. You can feed through those. So you're limited to these five. But I got to say, the designer has done a pretty good job of adding random elements to each scenario to make them more fun. Um, plus, there's the whole difficulty level thing. So you can, if you do beat the game playing on level two every time, you can go back and try to beat everything on level three. So at least there's a reason, and I'm going to guess that you, or more likely your kids, are going to want to go through and try to get the maximum points. So how different is it between the different difficulties? Like there's some re replayability uh, within each scenario, but when you when you step up from one to two to three, all it does is reduce the number of turns you have. So on easy, you have, say, 14 turns. On level two, you have 12 turns. On level three, you have 10 turns. So that's that's the only actual change. So it's how much time you have, how much time you can waste. Now, overall, despite my initial impression after of, of this game, after multiple plays, I found that this is a solid family weight cooperative game that so far has been fun for our entire family. Now, there is no way I would break this out for my Monday night gaming group. There's no way I'm going to bring this down to the CG realm and maybe bring it to easy mode to hook those people who are a little trepidatious about playing heavier games. But basically, I'm going to save this for when playing with the kids. But what I will note, there is more than enough tactics and tension and strategy required that I am still interested. So this is a game that the adults aren't going to necessarily be bored while playing with the kids. There's enough meat there. It's just probably not enough. Like, well, it probably is enough to keep an adult group happy, but there's better games you could be playing, to be honest. Something with more depth and more reward. If you've got kids who are into fantasy settings and like co-op games, I suggest picking this game up, which, again, is totally different than what I felt after the first play. So this is just a good way to see that it takes multiple plays to actually see the game. Uh, just don't go picking it up expecting a follow-up to Talisman. This is not Talisman Part 2. This is not a modern Talisman. To be honest, it's barely talisman at all. There are some talisman trappings scattered here and there, but mostly they're going to feel like Easter eggs for someone who knows the original game. Like, oh, I know what that is. Or, oh, I remember that follower. That's all you're going to get out of it. This is very much a game on its own. Yeah, and I think the, the, the big problem I see is this age on it. 
because a lot of people are going to look at that age and 14 plus and yeah. think based on that that it's going to be more like talisman than it actually is and a quick glimpse at the reviews on board game geek indicates that is what has happened yeah this people adults thought it that is disguised through its you know through its age as not being but it is very much a kid's game that the family can enjoy. Yep. So for a more in-depth look at Talisman Legendary Tales, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews. For those of you here live, that'll go live tomorrow probably because it's not quite done yet. <laughs> and now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our table. Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that may be going on. Well, there isn't a lot of cool gaming stuff going on right now. There's not a lot of anything going on right now. Um, the CG Realm did have their last game night um, last Saturday, but I chose not to attend, not taking any chances and staying home. Um, it is worth noting for anyone local, the CG Realm has canceled all future events um, for now until until we hear otherwise. Uh, we're definitely probably not going to be having the March events, and we'll see for the April events. I'm a little disappointed to hear that they went, chose to go ahead with their events, but admittedly, the directive to shut down, you know, everything restaurant-wise, had not yet come. And hindsight is 2020. Yeah, hopefully, it's not going to impact anyone who went to that event. I would hate to hear that the people that did show up that night were impacted in some way. So far, there's no cases locally. It's probably perfectly fine, but. We are a high-risk family for multiple reasons, so we chose not to take the risk. But I'm glad I hear it went well. And um, the game featured game was supposed to be pretty good. Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, played it. I can't even remember what game was. Stellar, I think, is the name of it for Renegade Games. It looked kind of neat. So it was a great two-player game, but um, great two-player game, but a table hog. So that one looked pretty neat. Um, so what we did do, though... Uh, we're stuck home with the kids, so I did get in a bit of gaming with the kids earlier in the week. Now, mostly we played some video games. They played Minecraft. They've been trying to build our house in Minecraft, which is kind of cool. Um, but we did play a couple of games of Ticket to Ride New York. Now, Big G knows how to play Ticket to Ride, the full version. Um, having played last on Christmas Eve, that's kind of our Christmas Eve uh, tradition every year is to play with, uh, with the extended family. But this was the first time playing Ticket to Ride for Little G. Now... Little G's a little newer to games and has a little bit more difficulty grasping all the concepts. And this is the reason I grabbed New York off the shelf, because I figured this would be a good introduction to the Ticket to Ride mechanics for her. And also, Ticket to Ride New York is a much quicker game yeah. uh, where I could see kids getting bored at a full game of Ticket to Ride if they yes. weren't already fans. Yeah, that is another thing. For expansion, it, attention span, Ticket to Ride New York is definitely a better call. Though having Little G play four games of Talisman Legendary Tales tonight, the attention span's there if she's interested. Now, we did play a few games in a row, and it went pretty well. I was a bit worried when teaching that it might have been a bit much. She just kind of did this stare-off-into-space thing. But you know what? Once she started playing, she seemed to have absorbed everything because it all seemed to come back while we were going. Now, the second game was obviously way better than the first, but she held her own, being totally new for this style of game. Oh, it's great to hear she likes it. I know I'm not a big train game fan, but you and Gia are, so it's not a bad thing if the young ones are too. Yeah. Though I don't know if I call this my train game. There's trains in it. There's cars in this one. You're, there's no pickup and deliver. It's, it's, it's definitely not Steam Light. It's a very different style of game. It's more like gin rummy with a board. But overall, I, I'm still, every time I play Ticket to Ride New York, I'm shocked by it. Um, it's not a game I sought out. It was a game I received for Christmas. So thank you for giving it to me because obviously I've been really enjoying it. I, I am not a huge Ticket to Ride fan. I'll play it. It's okay. But I just, Ticket to Ride New York just to me is a better game. It's just something about how quick and tight it is. And it always feels really close. And that quickness is also, it always makes me want to play again. It's almost the, the um, co-op game. Like when you lose a co-op game, is almost better than when you win because when you lose and it's close, you just want to play again to try again. I get that with Ticket to Ride New York. It's just because it's so tight. It's like, oh, I almost got that last route. I'm going to finish the game and complete three routes next time. Let's play again. You just get that again. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go it again. And I've been chastised by from the uh, uh, Ticket to Ride. Isn't a train game. It's a set collection game. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, the, the, the great thing about New York is that I suspect the, New, the London one is more than yeah, likely the same. the same. It's the you know, same thing, different locale uh the first time we played it we cracked it open that morning on like a saturday morning or something and flew through like three games yep. uh, you know 
as soon as we crack the rules. Yeah, it's solid. Now, the other game we played with the girls, this time it was the entire family for the first couple games, was Talisman Legendary Tales. Now, I pretty much covered this in the review section earlier, but we all had a great time playing this game. Uh, we played a total of four games in a row, which I would love to say means we beat all five scenarios. It should have, right? But no, we got rather stuck on scenario three and tried three times in a row and never managed to beat it before time ran out. Well, I know how that goes. We've had that uh, that same sort of scenario with uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle yep. a number of times. So Very happens. true. Now, what I like about Scenario 3, and I actually want to I want to get into this one in just a little bit more detail, and I almost included this in review, but I chose not to because I knew we had wanted to have something to talk about when we got to the, the week in review section, is um, this is what convinced me there's a lot more talism in this game than I initially thought. Now, it's not a legacy game, but if you're worried about spoilers, you own Talisman Legendary Tales, you haven't gotten to Scenario 3, just skip ahead a couple minutes if you don't want to hear about this. But what you do in this scenario, it's called uh, gob uh, Grabbing Goblin. And you're starting off in the forest, and you have learned that some goblins have a copy, of, have a talisman. And what you need to do is go out into the map, which is circular, and try to find, and I can't remember the word for it, but basically cowardly goblins who will spill the beans and tell you where their boss is hiding out. So you sit there, and you go around the map, and you find these different goblins. And there are the, these, these scared goblins, and there's a lot of them. Like, there's five or six different ones. And all you have to do is find the first three you find. And there's a bunch of other goblins that are out there you can fight as well. And they're all pretty weak. And what's neat is that when you get these coward goblins, you put them on the player board, and each of the goblins shows there, and there's a picture of the goblin with a little speech balloon. And one will be saying bones, another one will be saying um, fairies, another one will be saying mushrooms. And what happens is that once you catch all three of them, you look at what they're telling you, and then you find the tile that's on the board that has those three symbols, and that's where the goblin base is. And I thought that was fascinating. I'm like, that is a really neat mechanic that I would love to see in another game. And yes, there's the I spy aspect of someone's got to find those three symbols on one of the things. But you know what? The girls were really quick at it, especially because they knew that was what was coming. And then once you get it out there, you put out a goblin boss on that spot. And then there's a goblin wizard that goes on. And, but these guys require four symbols to beat. And while you're only pulling three chips from your bag, so with the base bags and the base game, you can't win. You cannot ever beat these bosses. So you have to do the talisman thing. You roll and move and move around the board, hitting encounter tiles, fighting the monsters to level up before you can go fight these two goblin bosses. Now, there's an additional thing in here where every so many turns, the wizard's going to cast a spell, and you roll on a table to see what happens to you. And this also feels very talisman-like. And here's where you get the witch aspect, where you can be knocked by a gust of wind that blows you back to the forest. You can get stunned, which you lay your miniature on your side, and your next turn all you can do is stand up. And then there's, I forget what, you can lose some of the items you've collected. If you have any items on the table in front of you, you lose one of them. Which, again, very much feels like the original talisman with, like, the random squares where good or bad things happen to you. Eventually, if you can beat the goblin bosses, you get a talisman off them. We haven't been able to pull this off yet. We've tried. we tried three times. We got the bosses on the table every time. But I gotta say, like, if that doesn't sound at least a bit like the original Talisman to you, like, that it finally had that feel. I'm like, all right, it's allowed to have the Talisman name. I'm not gonna complain anymore. It's allowed to have that moniker on the box. Though it's still not an evolution and still way too simple. No, it's, uh, again, it's a, it's a kids-themed family game, not a, you know, competitive dungeon crawler. Yeah. So, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Yeah, well, that's the question right now, isn't it, right? Uh, this weekend, we were all supposed to be at BreakoCon, and I am bummed that's postponed. I was really looking forward to that. With that canceled, all local gaming is canceled, social distancing, self-quarantining, it's going to be gaming with the family or gaming online. So I do hope to get in some more gaming with the kids, um, maybe actually finish Stuff Fables, or maybe return to Mice and Mystics. Uh, the kids, I, more Stuff Fables, Little G was actually asking about it today. She's like, I want to play that puppet game, puppet stuffed animals, close enough. Uh, we should sit down and play Hogwarts again. I I basically put that one on hold again. Little G wasn't quite ready for it when we broke it out originally. And plus for Deanna and I, I'm kind of hoping we'll get through some two-player games in our pile of shame. We've got quite a few heavier two-player games that we never got around to. But to be honest, nothing's really solid at this point because who knows what's going to happen next week. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's... Uh... Sadly, I think that's the case for most people. Just a lot of unknowns happening worldwide right now. 
now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP members. Our Patreon backers greatly appreciate it. Diane Susan Owen. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering, although they have taken a short break to deal with uh, social yeah. distancing and try and figure out how they're going to make that work out. Yeah, I was wondering about that. I meant to look it up before the show, so good. Good on them for not getting together and pushing through. Like, we are lucky in the fact that Sean and I are not local to each other and do this through video conferencing, but the Mr. Acton Mark guys tend to record in person together. Uh, Evil John, one of the gaming, there's something we should have had in our in our look ahead. We owe you another game this month, so we'll get in touch on Discord, try to plan something out. And if you're interested, maybe we'll live stream it on a Friday. Wayne Homefleet. Thanks, Wayne. Roger Malash. So, what's going to be the next must-buy game I teach you, Roger? Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to go live and hit your podcatchers on YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. and Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.